live platform. My name is Eric Sheehan with OTT Inc. For the webinar this morning, everyone's lines will be muted. Upon completion of the presentation, we will unmute everyone's lines and provide the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and we'll have a team here to address those questions uh, for you. Um, this morning, we are pleased to have with us Greg DeGray, who's a Microsoft uh, engineer um, at Microsoft and an expert in the field service uh, platform. And also from um, our host team here at OTT, uh, we have Sarah Britton, uh, Ron Peterson, um, two of our uh, field service consultants, um, along with myself, Eric Sheehan, who will uh, go through um, some information on the solution via PowerPoint. And then we will turn it over to Greg for a demo. Uh, what our focus is going to be today is, as I mentioned, the field service application. We will look at things that include resource scheduling, um, the mobile application for field service, uh, connected field service, um, some higher tech things, HoloLens, I'll just brief, touch on briefly. And then Dynamics 365 Business Central um, is the back-end uh, financial application that we will integrate field service with. Um, due to time constraints, we are not going to be covering um, the financial aspects of Business Central. We will have a future webinar on that. So our focus today is going to be on the field service application. Um, so what is field service? Um, field service can cover areas in your business from uh, installation, maintenance, uh, the traditional break fix, um, and also uh, managing assets that you may have um, out in the field. And if we look at a typical uh, workflow uh, for field service, um, you'll receive a request for a job, um, and then someone is going to need to schedule and dispatch for that job, make contact with the customer, um, perform the needed service, and then collect payment from the customer. And then once that cycle is complete, the actual work order um, can be completed and closed out and saved into your historical records. Um, again, areas where field service uh, really stands out, enterprise asset management, uh, maintenance and management systems, um, traditional uh, field service, and transportation logistics. So here's a little information based on um, a research study that the Service Council did. Um, they stated from their research that the average first-time fix rate is only 74% meeting that more than a quarter of service calls require uh, return visits. What are the common reasons for those? Uh, the technician lacked the right tool or part to complete the job. Uh, the technician simply ran out of time uh, for the service call. Um, the technician could not access or make access to the required information, or the technician didn't have the expertise um, to solve the issue. All of those reasons uh, can lead to uh, bad outcomes for your business, which include you know, dissatisfied customers, broken service level agreements, technicians on your team that are frustrated, and a waste of time and resources. So areas that we've seen success with Dynamics 365 field service, um, this is not an all-inclusive list, but just a, a highlight of a few areas. Um, industrial services, so HVAC and building systems, uh, companies that have facilities management, uh, manufacturing in the area of areas of discrete and oil and gas, um, property management, um, government, healthcare, and then medical um, device and equipment manufacturing and service. So how do businesses view their service organization? It really depends upon the maturity of their service organization. Um, they are viewed in one of three ways, either a cost center, a profit center, or a servitization engine. So a cost center, those companies, their goal is to operate efficiently so that they minimize the cost of servicing the products that they produce. A profit center viewpoint, they view field service as an opportunity to differentiate from competitors and drive strong margins. Servitization engine, they're moving to a service-based business model where they deliver outcomes rather than products. So how mature is your service organization? Here are just a few questions um, that you can ask yourself to help analyze your business. Um, how does your service organization support business goals? 
if you're a cost center, your service organization exists to support products that you produce and then you repair them when they break or malfunction. So more of a responsive approach. If you're a profit center, um, your organization helps keep products up and running, but more importantly, it helps them stand out from the competition. In the servitizing model, the whole business has become a service organization. You make products, but you sell them as services that drive key customer outcomes. How do you define success for your service organization? If you're a cost center, you wanna make sure you're minimizing costs. Profit centers are focused on building customer loyalty and driving strong margins. In the servitizing model, uh, customers um, are achieving their goals because business model outcome is oriented. And how does the organization price the service that you deliver um, in a cost center model? It's typically a cost plus model. Um, those focused on profit center tend to do more of a fixed price model and those in the servitizing um, sell our products and services using an outcome-based model. So let's take uh, just a little bit deeper dive at each of these models. The cost center model, um, cost center businesses care about minimizing um, expenses. Um, they look at minimizing downtime, um, increasing first-time fix rates, maximizing you know, productivity, and optimizing service scheduling. Um, what challenges do they face? Um, lack of visibility into asset performance, um, limited diagnostics, uh, a low first-time fix rate, um, inability to coordinate um, technicians, tools, and parts availabilities to complete the job, and then sometimes being sent out on unnecessary service calls. Um, so some things to think about um, if your model is more of a cost center business, um, how often do your technicians require multiple visits? What does it cost you every time you have to dispatch a service technician? How do you learn that your equipment is malfunctioning? How often do you send technicians to check on equipment that's actually functioning properly? And then how often are your technicians un unable to fix an issue because they lack the right resources or expertise? So some key things to start thinking about if your business is set up uh, more of a cost center model. Looking at the profit center model, um, they look at redu reducing service costs by minimizing downtime, increasing fix rates, um, maximizing their scheduling, and um, productivity of the technicians. Um, what challenges do profit center businesses face? Um, visibility and performance, fix low fix rates, limited diagnostic capabilities, um, inability to coordinate with technicians, and unnecessary service calls. Some of the things that um, you can question um, are require multiple visits. How many times does it cost, or what does it cost you each time you dispatch a service technician? Um, is your equipment malfunctioning? And do you send people out to check on equipment that's actually functioning properly? Um, the next piece here is looking at the servitizing model. Um, what businesses with this model are more concerned about is how they differentiate from competitors how they increase their top line revenue, open up new revenue streams for the business, and help driving business transformation. Um, challenges they face, uh, commoditization is reducing profitability, um, competitors are experimenting with new business models, um, customers' expectations continue to evolve, and then the widespread internet of things, which we'll talk more about later, um, being adopted. And then things to question, um, what is your strategy for differentiating from competitors? And then what role do services play in your long-term business strategy? Do you have a plan for transforming your services business to open new revenue streams? Are you developing product as a service offerings? And um, how are you responding to the competitors in the workplace? So a bit about scheduling. Scheduling is a key component um, to the field service um, application. Um, it will focus on things, uh, what skills are available, um, what resources do we have available, uh, do we have crews or groups of people that we need access for scheduling, um, what type of work orders do we have to schedule for, do we need access to uh, inventory, and, and what types of assets are we managing out in the field. Um, we can also get into more into projects um, in addition to the the field service work orders and uh, you know assign roles, uh, do time and progress billing and uh, managing of expenses. 
So some key entities um, that are involved in um, scheduling is how long is it going to take, the duration of work, how is it measured, um, how is the project going to be managed, what do the service level agreements say, what are the detailed tasks, uh, planning, um, when is this going to be done, how long is it going to take, um, what type of work is it, um, are, we, are we doing a new installation, is it a maintenance or repair, um, and then recording our work, um, so the tasks that are being done, the time that is being spent. So some areas of investment um, around scheduling are who is available, um, how do we prefer to fulfill the job, um, what teams are available, uh, what facilities are we going to be working at, and what's their availability, and then the different um, pools of resources that we need to com successfully complete the job. Um, here's just a, a quick little screenshot of resource scheduling. Um, it can integrate with maps. Um, on your devices so that you can see where technicians are um, throughout the workday and if you need to quickly dispatch them to another location, um, you'll be able to track time and distance it takes for them to get to the next job site. And then as you can see here, you can um, view multiple resources calendars um, on one uh, single screen. Field service is mobile. This is really important um, because it's supported on um, multiple device platforms, iOS, uh, Android, and Windows. So whether you have an iPhone, an Android phone, a Windows phone, um, a tablet, you know, a MacBook, whatever it may be, um, the application um, will work in that environment. Um, so as long as you have an internet connection, um, you're going to be connected live to uh, the system at any point in time. So connected field service is, is really a, a new term that um, connects um, our customers uh, with our, our team of employees. Um, along with our operations and the products, and then externally, this in Internet of Things data, the IoT data, is connecting um, external devices that you may service that are feeding information um, back to your home system. So what do we mean by connected field service? When Internet of Things and Dynamics 365 are used together, they enable customers to proactively detect, troubleshoot, and resolve issues remotely. Um, so it allows a combination of field service and the Internet of Things that together enable customers to incorporate that data into their service operations, which can lead to you know, more efficiency because you're able to fix things remote. Um, it'll allow you to optimize um, the structure of your service organization and the management of your inventory. Um, so just another screenshot here on the right hand side, you can see an example of, you know, the, the Internet of Things where devices that are out in the field um, that are connected to your system that you can actually monitor uh, remotely, whether that's a, a building, a computer system, a, a vehicle, um, there's a lot of different, um, a piece of equipment, a lot of different examples that come into play um, here. And it's all connected um, with your um, business application Dynamics 365 field service. And the architecture of the system also allows you to build out um, additional components that may be unique to your organization. Um, so it provides the ability to have um, special configuration to meet your needs. Um, again, just a little bit more picture um, here on the central um, architecture. This is all based on um, the cloud. Um, there's workflows built into the system, uh, reporting, um, and then the core application, and it's all provided to you in a highly secure environment running on the Microsoft Azure platform. So um, I mentioned workflow. Um, there's predefined workflow um, within the system, some templates um, that allow you to receive um, alerts from devices out in the field to your central system. Um, you can send device property updates um, to central. You can send work order updates, send booking updates, um, and all of these are configured into one single integrated environment. The uh, HoloLens that we were talking about here, this gets into some high tech things that Microsoft has been, been working on where you can actually you know, have the lens on, watch a video on how to repair something um, as you're actually doing the, the work. So 
this gets a little bit more into you know reality um, video game type uh, experience um, but it is being deployed out in the field today and can provide a lot of value um, not only to the service organization but to the end customer that is being served so together um, what would it look like if you went down the path um, to transform your service organization um, what we have outlined here is, you know, the first step we go through an assessment with you, talk about your business strategies, uh, what are your desired outcomes, and define uh, what we call critical success criteria, things that are an absolute must for you that you have to get out of the system. Once that's done, we show you a, a demonstration of the software and how it's going to meet your needs. And then we start getting into more of the details through the analysis. Uh, talk about key business processes, what are the system dependencies with um, multiple systems that you may have? And what is the scope of the project? So those two steps tip typically take in total a one to four week time frame. And then we move into actually planning the engagement. Um, what are the goals? What are the expectations? Who are the members of the, of the project teams? And uh, then we move into implementation uh, following our methodology um, we start designing the system. Uh, communication throughout the implementation is, is key um, to make sure that we're managing scope and delivering on all of the line items in the project plan. Um, so that time period typically is a two to six month, again, based on the size of your organization and, and the scope of the project. Then we uh, get ready to go live uh, with launch and support. We go live, we make sure all the deliverables have been met, um, have we achieved all of the critical success criteria? And then finally, ongoing support. Um, as you continue to use the system, your business will continue to change, the software will continue to change, and uh, as a, a local partner here, we're here to help you uh, manage through all those changes. So now at this time, um, what I'm going to do is change presenter um, over to Greg, and Greg is going to um, be able to uh, provide a uh, demo of the solution here. Sounds great. Let me show my screen now. Okay. There we go. Looks great. You can see it. Perfect. Let me put some power. Some power, power line. Yeah. <laughs> the, the power platform. So, um, the, Thank you uh, for you know inviting me to the call. I'm really happy to be a part of this webinar and kind of talk about field service, uh, connected field service, and a little bit of Business Central. Um, to set a little bit of context, I just wanted to introduce myself and one of my team members is also on call. So my name is Greg DeGru. Um, I'm joined by uh, Sukanya, who's also a partner technical architect on my team. Um, we're part of the One Commercial One Commercial Partner Organization, and um, essentially just at, at a very high level, how how we sort of engage with Microsoft partners and uh, the, cu the customers of those partners is um, through this uh, partner um, kind of build journey. And we, we touched on it a few moments ago. So um, today we're very much focused on education. So there's a, a demo um, and some briefings that I'm going to do around field service and the various services there. Um, but uh, we offer a lot, um, excuse me, of support be beyond that as well in terms of designing and implementing um, Dynamics 365 solutions. Um, and we also have uh, some connections to the product team. So everything that I'm talking about today um, has in, in some way also been through some conversation to the product team to help with my own um, internal education and also some feedback that I've provided to the product team along with my um, team members. Uh, so I just want to set some context there in terms of who we are. Uh, to kick things off, I'm going to open up um, the Dynamics 365 portal. Uh, I should note before going in there, um, if anyone wants to uh, spin up their own instance of Dynamics 365 for free, uh, there's this website, trials.dynamics.com. And for all of the major modules, we're focusing on field service today, of course, but for all the major modules, including Business Central, Finance and Operations, Retail Sales, um, you have the ability to spin up a uh, free trial um, to uh, you know, experiment and, and demo and do these sort of uh, kind of showcases on your own as well. Um, so once you've done something like that, I, I have a uh, personal subscription, so I have access to the same portals you would get through the trial. Um, once you have a trial or a subscription to Dynamics, you 
um, can hit the home.dynamics.com URL and you'll essentially gain access to all of your major applications. I, I'm, I'm going to search for the applications in my organization. So I'm just going to search for MS uh, OTT here. Um, and you see I have uh, quite a few different modules here. Field Service Hub and Field Service will be the main ones that we talk about today, along with Connected Field Service. Um, you you may, may be wondering why there are two Field Service applications in my Dynamics organization. Well, there um, is this concept of uh, sort of a uh, a, a new and classic uh, user interface, and that's sort of how we've divided up these applications. But we won't get into too much of that today, since that's kind of off topic there. But um, just you know, showing you the landing page for Dynamics, and to uh, get into my organization, first I'm going to go into this Dynamics 365 uh, dash custom app, and that should bring me to um, first my sales module and my dashboard here. But if I go up to the top and hit this drop down arrow in the site map um, you'll see i have a view into all of the major modules that i've installed in my uh, dynamics tenant um, of course there's field service which we're going to dive into in a little bit um, and it calls out some of the key things here i, I actually i was listening uh, as i was listening into um, the uh, deck that we were going through uh, moments ago you know when we talk about visibility into assets and diagnostics that's you know clearly clearly kind of outlined here. We have several inventory and purchasing options um, or orders and invoicing to kind of manage the financials for our uh, customer assets. Um, and when we talk about technician coordination, we're going to see this a lot um, in the demo and through all the different modules that are related to field service. But the scheduling board um, and kind of our, not, not our resource bookings, but our resources themselves, our technicians, we'll, we'll see that um, kind, of, kind of service not through just the field service module, but also um, the relevant uh, uh, kind of internet connected field service modules and resource scheduling module too. Um, so I'll, I'll go into field service first with the schedule board here. Then we'll go into uh, some of the other key areas. Um, this is generally where you, you would spend a lot of time, um, I guess, as a uh, operator or the, the manager of a field service organization. Um, this is the scheduling board and right now I'm just kind of showcasing uh, an example of, of manual scheduling. As you can see I already have uh, some uh, resource requirements on my schedule board already and, and how I created those was um, pr pr pretty simple. So this is all a clickable configurable um, interface. So if I wanted to uh, create a re resource requirement these are called. Um, all, all I have to do is drag um, along the time slot here, um, I'll line to my resource, and I can uh, select new here in the bottom left, and that brings me to the creation of my resource requirement page. So um, I'll get into the scenario in a bit, but just to talk about what these resource requirements are all about first, there's uh, skills, roles, organizational unit, resource preferences. These are all associated with how we determine um, what resource fits the job that we're sending them to uh, create here. So you can also uh, name this. And in, in this case, I'm playing the role of the operator. I would say manager, I guess, of this uh, field service organization. So I'm the owner um, of this, and I'm assigning someone to it. Um, a lot of these other fields too, as you saw, I, I dragged a window of timeout on the scheduling board. What's really cool about that is the from date and to date. Um, I, I could select that myself if I want, um, but these would be auto-populated along with the duration because that's already sort of predefined on the scheduling board. Um, if you want as well, um, you know, we we covered uh, not not just resource scheduling in the PowerPoint, but also um, project service automation. We're not going to go. Um, into that uh, in, in this call, but if you want to assign uh, projects to these um, resource requirements, you could do that as well. And there's some pricing and location information that comes from that. Um, what's uh, also really important, we'll see this when we get to the IoT aspect, but um, you, you can imagine these requirements uh, come in multiple forms. So there could be multiple multiple requirements uh, for a single re for a single uh, kind of field service job. And that single field service job is expressed through something that we call a work order. Um, and you see if I use this lookup view, I have quite a few pre-created uh, ones. So, so some of this came with the Dynamics 365 sample data, and some of this actually came from 
uh, IoT device data that we have running in the background. Um, and then there's uh, also this other information uh, that, again, is auto-populated. Um, for demo purposes, since this is kind of manual scheduling, um, just one of the flavors of scheduling, there's um, others that are more automated and um, uh, kind of s separate from this topic here. But uh, for, for demo purposes, if you'd uh, like to really showcase the power of the mapping, we also have the ability for you to enter um, the exact coordinates for your locations uh, of, uh, of these tasks, uh, the, these resource requirements themselves. Um, so I, I'll, I'll show you how I've, I've done that as well and some of the resource requirements I pre-created. Um, there's also the work location, so on-site, EPOT, location agnostic. But regardless, just showing the kind of the creation of the resource requirements, so I'll leave the page here. And I'll, I'll go into one that I've already created. So let's actually get into the scenario that we're covering here. Um, and to kind of paint a picture of the scenario, um, I will talk about this in detail, but essentially what we have is a field service organization that manages vending machines. Um, I'll, I'll demystify this later on, but what you're seeing now is a separate portal from Dynamics. This is IoT Central, um, but you don't need to worry about what, what, what all that means just yet. What you should care about right now is um, these are the assets that our organization is um, managing and monitoring uh, in our uh, field service organization. So we own a, a suite of vending machines um, and they need regular maintenance. We have a, a crew um, that, that goes out to install, do break fix, and, and monitor them. Um, as an, an operator, again, that's the role I'm serving as, I would spend my time looking at this dashboard for uh, our, our refrigerated vending machine. And you can see I have a large amount of data that comes in um, and uh, that I can see about it. So um, mainly around uh, kind of some of the out of the box features here, temperature, pressure, humidity, um, the machine information, which is pretty important. So the installation address, uh, serial number, and, and things like that. Um, and what's great about this application is um, this is not a real device. This is all simulated and used for scenarios like this, kind of um, pre-sales demos, e even technical demos. Um, and there's some of our uh, data integration services that we have um, in, in Dynamics. We can actually move this data back and forth between Dynamics 365 and this IoT Central application. But just wanted to set some context that our field service organization is serving the role of, of managing this uh, ho host of vending machines out there in the field. So um, I'll put this to the side again. But where, where, where are they? Where are these assets? So uh, Dynamics um, for field service provides a, uh, an insight into that. So you see on the schedule board, um, I have the ability to filter uh, where our resources are on the map and i can toggle this off and on to show where this is located but right now you see my map is kind of blank and sometimes that happens you'll open up the schedule board and you really don't see anything but if i click on um I believe this resource requirement here it's kind of hard to see so i'll zoom in see if it doesn't yeah it doesn't look too bad this first requirement for my resource is saying uh pick up a new vending machine. Um, and it's assigned to uh, my resource Abe. Um, it starts later on today and the booking status is committed. But one, one thing you'll notice is my map was blank initially, but when I clicked on this resource requirement, I'll, I'll do it for some different ones. You can see a pen has dropped um, to the exact location where this job takes place. Now, you may be looking at this map and saying, well, that's great, Greg, but still can't really tell where it is because <laughs> we're so zoomed out. Uh, so I'll zoom in so we can actually see what's going on. Um, our organization is kind of headquartered uh, in, in Japan. So um, it's a small organization and we have um, just Abe and Ashley managing the um, resource uh, field service tasks that are going on here. Um, and now, now you can see a, a better picture of how powerful the mapping is. So I'll zoom over to the schedule board in a better view. Um, you can see again, the pens dropping here, but the, and, an important piece here is as I went through kind of the resource requirement details, um, at a high level, this resource is uh, just looking at Abe here first off, is assigned to pick up a new vending machine um, and deliver the new vending machine to the destination address. Uh, and as a field technician, I know we were talking about kind of uh, predictive and pre preventative maintenance uh, with the walking deck and some other scenarios as well. But when we think about 
kind of the, the first time fixed rate and just the overall performance of technicians out in the field in general um, to, to have them armed with this knowledge uh, firsthand of what exactly they need to go out to do the task they need to complete and the route they need to take let's say um, to perform that task is kind of invaluable um, and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit more to kind of showcase the route um, as an operator I'll spend my time here but you can think you know as a field technician how would I want to approach my resource requirement when it's assigned to me. Um, if I go into actions here, I can provide some insight into that. I'll go into get driving directions, and I'll just kind of filter this a little bit here. So we're going to focus on um, our resource A, uh, looking at uh, t today, the, the window's fine here. If I go into um, our uh, resource address here, Let's see. Let's assign. Let's make sure these dates are lined up here. Resource address, resource address. Whoops. Abraham McCormick. There we go. So I'll just leave those filtered out there. You, you can see that we have the ability to uh, view the map in uh, kind of different rendered styles and also uh, have the ability to uh, print and, and see driving directions for um, the resource routes for our, our technicians here. Uh, so that's, that's pretty powerful. Uh, let me zoom out. And I'll refresh this page so we can get back to our full view. Um, and I'm spending a lot of time on the schedule board because that's, um, I feel, at least one of the uh, key value points and kind of where everything comes together. We talked about scheduling and uh, how to manage resource requirements and the like through um, our presentation, but it all really comes together in a surface through the scheduling board. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stop there because I don't want to spend all the time on the scheduling board. Um, you know, it's well kind of captured here. You, you could imagine, you know, I used two resources to showcase this, but um, you, you could have multiple routes managed at any given time. Um, but there, there, there's much more to field service than just the schedule board here, because there's a lot of information behind the scenes that uh, eventually gets to this board and is assigned to the resource. So let's start getting into that. Um, I kind of touched on work orders. so. These resource requirements, these individual calendar items, um, in, in, in my scenario, I'm kind of using them as uh, kind of tasks under a, a work order. Um, and wor work orders can come in, in a few different flavors. I have service calls, inspections, IoT break fix that I'm going to get into very soon. Um, you can imagine the uh, tasks that I've put on here. Um, like the installation of this new vending machine, uh, the picking up and installation of the new vending machine um, is kind of a result of an IoT break fix scenario. So there was a scenario where we had to actually replace the entire vending machine um, for our account here. So if I go into this work order, um, one, one thing I should know too, I kind of mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the call, but what we're looking at also is the new or is the old user interface for Dynamics 365 and in a moment we're going to look at the new user interface as well just to get a difference um, for, for how that looks but um, so for our uh, work order here uh, you can see that there's various stage gates that are associated with it um, the initial creation you can create a case um, you can finalize and create the work order but mo most importantly uh, you can schedule the work order so the scheduled work order is actually assigned to a technician, and that's where all those uh, scheduling blocks on the calendar uh, kind of comes from. So if I scroll down, um, this is important too to revisit this primary incident. You'll see various services, service tasks, record logs, and things like that. Um, so this is another example of how uh, 
kind of other um, entities and field service get uh, assigned to the scheduling board. Um, but unlike the entities that I, or unlike the resource requirements that I showed in the schedule board here, uh, well, one thing interesting to call out on this uh, particular example work order is um, what's noted here in the settings. So this work order is noted as an IoT break and fix. Um, and what's what's cool about this is in the case of uh, these uh, res resource requirements that I created for our technicians, I, I, I created these automatic or I created these manually. I came and I dragged and dropped um, these tasks for our technicians myself. Um, but let, let's say we wanted to automate our system. Let's say we didn't want to, uh, you know, drag and have to one by one manually create these tasks for our technicians ourselves. Um, we can actually use the power of another field service called Connect the Field Service to um, enable some automated scenarios. So the majority of this data in here, the uh, service account, um, system status, uh, the primary incident type, duration, and the IoT alert itself, this was all automatically generated from that IoT central application that uh, I showed um, a, a bit earlier on. And I'm actually going to um, go into that in a moment. Um, so I'm going to pop back over into this. So this is a completely new interface, but this is still Dynamics 365. So I mentioned that there's this concept of an old and a new UI. Um, this is that new UI. And um, what's even cooler than that, this is probably my favorite part because this is where I spend a lot of time, <laughs> uh, is what we're seeing now is um, a, another uh, I don't want to call it a module, another feature of field service called connector fields, called connected field service. So in that work order I showed, I mentioned that it was an IoT prefix. And that data was kind of captured from IoT devices automatically. Um, this is that data. This is the automatically captured data here um, that we're uh, kind of surfacing in this table called active IoT alerts. Um, in our case, just to do a quick reminder, uh, I'll see if I can put these side by side and hopefully it won't look too squished. <clears throat> As an operator, if we want to, and again, this is all um, just showing the, the full capabilities of field service. You don't necessarily have to have an IoT scenario. You can fully go into field service and notice what I what have IoT connected devices. But um, from a simulated and demo standpoint, this is just showcasing um, the, the power that we have. Um, all this active IoT alert data is, is coming from this uh, IoT central application. Um, and again, this is separate from Dynamics. Uh, I, I'll just pull this in here briefly. It's going to take like a, a few seconds to talk about this. You don't need to be an Azure expert. Uh, I should note that IoT Central is kind of a service uh, underneath Azure, whereas you know field service is a service under Dynamics 365, so two different clouds. Um, but you don't need to be an Azure expert at all. Like, like I mentioned, this, this page here came out of the box. I literally clicked on um, Get Started. Uh, I created a new application. There's actually quite a few that I'm playing around, that I'm using here for demos and, uh, and, and research. But I clicked this new application button, and boom, you're actually brought to uh, this dashboard here, um, first off. But uh, you know, through some of the menus here, you can get to this page. Um, and just like the trials website that I showed for Dynamics early on, um, you can also do a trial for IoT Central as well. Um, but be, beyond the configuration and logistics there, um, like, like I mentioned, this data is automatically captured. This IoT data is automatically captured from this IoT Central service. Um, but how is it captured? How is this data integration actually taking place? So th this is a very, very, very important concept because this, I'll say very one more time because I want to emphasize that this uh, data integration is taking place for our IoT devices to Dynamics through um, our service called Microsoft Flow. And you could you could see what's so important that even within the uh, kind of application ribbon here, we have a uh, menu um, out of the box uh, in Dynamics that allows you to create and see your flows. So we, we don't need to look too deeply into 
uh, what flow looks like, but you just need to know that flow is the service that is used to create this data integration. Um, and if I go to IoT Central again, I'll, I'll move away from this dashboard page. If I go into Rules and click on High Temperature Alert, you'll see that I've defined um, a uh, temperature alert to um, send this um, IoT device telemetry. So again, this is one of the major points we brought up um, during the deck, visibility into asset diagnostics. This, this solves for that problem. Um, so I, I can set condition, a condition for this telemetry data to say, when over 40 degrees, uh, call my Microsoft Flow action. So this is where the data integration is taking place. And all of the uh, relevant and important device data uh, for my vending machine um, is sent to Dynamics 365. And from there, I can start doing uh, anything I normally um, would, would do and would find important in field service. So um, I've created uh, some work orders already, but I'll go ahead and just do one from scratch. So if I click on this IoT alert here, um, you'll see it, it came. Again, this is all auto-populated. Uh, looks like my browser's kind of lagging there, so I'll refresh the page. Come on. So once this pops up, loading timeline, you'll see that um, all this uh, data here, all these fields within this alert was automatically um, pulled from IoT Central. So the alert type, you can see the various alert types here. There's info, tests, uh, paper jam. You could even define your own. So um, you're even seeing different scenarios with printers. You could do uh, per predictive maintenance on anything you uh, could really think of. Um, alert token, the exact time the alert took place. Um, from from a developer standpoint, because um, this is important when you start talking about uh, kind of device management, e even if you have an existing investment in devices that you've owned for decades, there's some level of um, developer engineering that goes on there. There's uh, uh, kind of this JSON data, this IoT alert data that you could give to a developer and they can use um, to you know do the, the work that they need to do. But more importantly, at a, at a high level, um, you see that this IoT alert is associated with a customer asset. And this customer asset can, of course, be tied to all the financials and ownership and things like that that we do in field service. But even beyond that, if you wanted to do a data integration to one of our other key systems that we mentioned, Business Central, um, that's where this becomes important. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, but to kind of showcase what's, what's going on here. So um, I mentioned these work orders. Uh, here are automatically created from the IoT alerts, and that's that's kind of how it all happens. Um, so now that I have this, then that, that, that was the main talking point here. I wanted to show how these work orders are automatically created and how we can schedule them. Um, and if if I go through uh, this these stage gates here, this step-by-step uh, -step process, you'll see that since I've received this IoT alert, I can go ahead and click on the, the target, hit next stage, and first create a case, so a record that this um, uh, kind of alert or this anomaly has been detected for our vending machine. Um, I can associate it with a customer. Uh, in this case, I've been working a lot with um, a, a Dantum Corporation, so I'll put them in there. Um, I can give it a case title. Um, I could say vending machine overheat. Um, then give it a subject if I'd like. Uh, I would say default subject. I'll do a case type, which is a problem. Um, the one thing I'll know too is that this uh, customer Adantum also has a, a few contacts associated with them. So um, through Dynamics 365, we have, uh, not to go too deep, but we have some really powerful relationship, um, we, we call them entities, but we have these really powerful entity mappings that go between all the different uh, core roles in Dynamics 365. So because I've chosen this customer, the system was smart enough to automatically say, oh, you've chosen that customer. Here are all the contacts associated with them. And I can choose that contact. Uh, of course, the IoT alert is associated with the case. Um, and I can put these order details if I'd like as well. But um, I know we're getting close on time, so I want to start moving a bit faster. Then we can move on to questions. Um, but now that I've created a, a case from this IoT alert, um, you can see that uh, this is kind of an intermediate step between 
the predict and maintenance and the work order going to the scheduling board that we show that was really important. This is kind of just for, I, I guess, a knowledge article standpoint. Like, let's say we've seen this this case uh, happen quite a few times. Like, this is a, um, a occurrence that we expect to see this type of anomaly uh, kind of uh, now and in the future. And there's articles, uh, field service connections, and, um, and, and knowledge records that will allow us to better arm, let, let, let's say, a technician when we eventually schedule the work order to say, we've seen a case like this before. Here's all the knowledge around this. Like, this is the equipment you need to bring. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the general lay of the land when you're dealing with a, a, case, a, um, a, a case or a situation like this. So, um, and you can see that I've already done that. I've, made, I, I, I didn't mention this at first, but the vending machines that we're working with actually only have bananas in them. Um, I, don't know, I really like bananas, so that's uh, what's what's going on there. But the incident is a, a regular occurrence, so I've already defined. I just created a new um, kind of in the back end. The this banana refrigerator needs attention incident. So this is a common type associated with all this um, important case knowledge. And when I go to the next stage, we can actually create the work order. Um, so the work order summary is uh, uh, bang. Vending machine needs attention, attention, and just got my uh, service account, billing account. That'll be possibly um, important when we get to like financial and business central integration. Uh, there's all these other incident types and fields. You could do the work order type. This is important here because um, this is information that our technician will need. So, is it an, an inspection, installation? Is it an IoT? Uh, kind of scenario, and it is. So we're going to um, uh, place that as the work order type. It's a break fix. Um, and we have a case associated with it, uh, as well as the IoT alert, <clears throat> and the system status. So it's it's unscheduled, but soon to be scheduled and in progress. And there, there's also pricing, too. So even though Dyn Dynamics 365 or field service uh, isn't uh, you know, solely about the financials, like the accounting and pricing and things like that, we still have the ability to tie different uh, price lists and different currency types too. So in, in this case, my sample system just has US dollar. So I'll save and close um, to create the work order. And I'll go on to the next stage to schedule it. So open on scheduled. Can't change the good. Oops, sorry about that. So anyway, I've I've already scheduled some, so I don't need to really go the remainder to to close it. Um, but I just wanted to provide a look at the life cycle of a work order um, in these cases, um, and this kind of all comes full full circle because now, as we talked, as I talked about at the beginning, um, and even surface tier and connected field service, as again the schedule board. This is where you're going to spend a lot of time. Um, or at least I do in my demos and work. Um, so now that that work order has been received, we can associate it with it. Uh, let me click on one of these here and zoom in. So now, now that that work order has been created, if we wanted to, we can go and uh, scroll down our schedule board and create the one or multiple new resource requirements, just drag out like I've done here to, um, to tell our technician, hey, this is a new work order that came in. These are all the requirements you need to complete um, in order to, uh, uh, to to complete that work order. Um, so really powerful stuff there. And you see it didn't, that all kind of came full circle. Um, and yeah, that, that pretty much covers it for the dynamics um, and the IoT. Uh, side, so I'll kind of click on IoT alerts here and just put these side by side to show the importance and relevance. Um, but there's one more thing. Uh, so to close out, I know we wanted to mainly talk about field service and a little bit of the IoT integration, but there's also <clears throat> an up and coming integration. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll show this <clears throat> here. I believe I've got it in one of my tabs. Doesn't look like I do, so I'll just quickly pull this up. Products. 
so we've got all these customer assets we own um, a lot of assets in our organization like these IOT devices um, th th these also could be surfaced in the form of products so there's obviously many different ways we can surface the assets that we own um, what's what's cool about these products that I have here is you'll see one called uh, Athens desk so I'll, I'll click on it um, this uh, Athens desk and some some of the there, there's a little bit of information here uh, th this uh, data was is not sample data this did not come out of the box or that this was not something I created manually from um, Dynamics 65 this actually came from um, our other key module, Business Central, and I uh, don't want to steal my, my teammates' thunder, but I'll kind of open it up and um, we can briefly talk about this to close out because there's a, a very powerful integration, uh, or not not sort of out of the box, but a, a very powerful concept integration that, um, let's see if I can sign in here. Yes, sign in. Oh, sorry about that. Well, I'll. I'll log in off screen and I'll put the integration on screen because that's more important to show. Um, anyway, so what uh, field service and um, business central, it, this, this data integration uh, notes finance and operations. So you don't, this the, kind of calls out a finance and operations uh, uh, template scenario that, that is there, um, but the integration that I'm talking about, again, is related to Business Central and works the exact same way. So even though it, it says finance and operations here, this integration that I'm showcasing um, between the accounts and customers, products and product, price lists, all, all works in the same way, even the work orders to sales orders. Um, so let me log in here off screen and I'll uh, kind of show you where this product came from. And I'll show you, um, how this data integration takes place, and then we'll kind of close it out. Uh, so let's see. So I, I don't mean to, let me grab this URL here. Don't mean to do this off screen, but I'm having some issues logging in. So I'll just type this in here. Um, and I guess while I'm logging in, I'll put this up here to speak to as well. Uh, I, I kind of mentioned Microsoft Flow as our, our way to do data integration. Um, this is a very important concept too, because this is, you know, something that's commonly done with uh, our different services and how things are done here. I, I'm not going to go into these deeply, but um, and you know, kind of uh, d don't worry about the fact that this is Microsoft Azure and I've got all these other things going on here. The, the important thing you need to know is this. Uh, clear color window here. This is um, Azure Logic Apps, but Microsoft Flow works the exact same way. We have these various connectors. Um, so uh, uh, kind of an HTTP connector, or if I cr create a new step, I'll actually just search for some. Let's see, Dynamics. Yep, there we go, it's right there. So these various connectors like Dynamics 365, and Business Central, and with uh, with um, kind of Microsoft Flow and Logic Apps allows you to do is if you have data and all these different systems, so um, IoT Central, excuse me, that I showed, um, Dynamics 365, Business Central. If if you had other systems that you worked with, like Salesforce, um, what what Logic Apps and Microsoft Flow allows you to do is bring um, uh, it not not bring. Well, what Microsoft Logic Apps allows you to do is is to share that data between those systems. So you can do creates and reads and updates, and it's just just very powerful. And I I think because as Microsoft we ha have this as a platform, it really allows you to um, not just focus on the dynamics or the business central side, the IoT side, but really any side to business applications. So I'm sure many of um, you all today, as customers and Microsoft partners, probably have investments in other things too, like Salesforce. And you know, if you're interested in using Dynamics and want that data surfaced in some way here, we have the ability to do that. Now, um, I'm kind of stalling here because I'm having trouble uh, logging into Business Central. That's why I'm, I'm showing this. But 
um, I'll see if I can log in there. But well, the, the reason that I mentioned that is because <clears throat> as you see us get deeper and deeper, I'll start to close out because we're running low on time. You, you'll see that to make some of these scenarios possible, it's, it's going to require um, so, some level of guidance uh, to, to understand some of these services. And, and that, that, that's why I'm here. That's why uh, the, our, our partner on call is here. You know, we want to take you through this journey together. So we're not just showing you these demos to say, hey, here's how it's done. This is what you need to do. But actually very much ha happy to meet beyond this and go on call to walk through how to create these data integrations as well. Um, but anyway, let me see if I can finally log in. And then we'll uh, open the floor for <clears throat> questions and to close out. So log in, paste. Yes, please sign me in. Perfect. And now I can pull <clears throat> Dynamics back up. So anyway, all, all that data connector stuff uh, makes this possible. I have, I have two very different systems, Dynamics on the left, and Business Central on the right. And because of uh, this, this Logic app or Microsoft Flow service, I'm able to share data between them. Um, and you'll see if I go into uh, my, my items here, just to prove that um, you know this is not, not, not magic. I'm, I'm demystifying it. Um, this the same Athens desk is the same one that we have in Dynamics 365. And we could pull a lot more data if we'd like. It's a deep, deeper integration, but I'm um, just showing kind of the art of the possible there. And um, I guess this also paints a view into Business Central as well. I, I'm not a Business Central expert, and I don't want to put you on the spots account. I know we're kind of running low on time, but um, th th this is our key financial application. And um, you know there are, are paths to create demos and trials for this too. Um, so yeah, that uh, kind of covers it there. I wanted to close out with the data integration piece, and now I guess I'll um, turn the floor over to the, the rest of the folks on call. Or um, you know, again, like I said, I didn't mean to kind of overtake the whole conversation. But Scott, kind of, if you'd like to mention anything too, then uh, happy to let you chime in as well. But yeah, that kind of covers it for um, from my end. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, at this time, are there any questions on the presentation uh, today or the application? It appears not. So we will make this uh, presentation uh, available on our uh, website um, in the coming days. And then um, our next webinar that we have coming up will be on May 22nd, and that is going to be focused on uh, Microsoft Dynamics GP and the changes that are coming down the pipeline for that. So invites for that webinar will be going out in the next uh, week or two, and we look forward to uh, hosting you on the 22nd. So thank you all, and uh, have a great day. Great. Thanks, everyone.